if we wanted to go inside the human body, for example, uh, ingest them in separate pieces and then have them assemble in the body. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. A big part of designing or engineering for the future is figuring out new ways to do things and new materials with which to do them. To do this kind of work, you need specialized equipment and advanced capabilities. The Stanford Nano Shared Facilities is part of the National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure Program, dedicated to supporting technology innovation at 16 sites across this country. We are joined by Christopher B. Cooper, a student working on his PhD in chemical engineering at Stanford University and co-author of a new study in which they demonstrated a multi-layer skin that can realign or heal after being cut or sliced autonomously. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Nate. How did you get interested in chemical engineering? Yeah, so I started at chemical engineering at NC State. I did my bachelor's degree. Initially, I started just because I liked chemistry and I liked math. Mm -hmm. um, but in doing the bachelor's, I found that chemical engineers are able to answer questions related to a wide range of problems in today's society. So uh, at a large scale, we look at like fluid flow, so either gas or right. liquid flow. So that could be how gases are moving in the atmosphere and tracking different particles. It could be in the body, looking at how blood might transport uh, different vitamins or nutrients throughout the body, or it can be looking at like lithium ions that are diffusing in your batteries for energy storage. Right. It's a lot easier to kind of see what the applications are in that particular field. So how did you become in a state where you're investigating self-aligning polymers? Yeah. So, so in our work in particular, um, in Janan's group, we're interested in how can we get electronics to interface better with the human body? Uh, so that's either on the skin uh, outside or in the body, like in an implantable electronic, where maybe it's coated around an organ to do some type of sensing in a long-term scenario. Um, and so one of the issues with those types of electronics is they're soft, they're easy to damage. And right. so if you put something onto your skin and you want it, you know, you want to wear it in everyday use, you might scratch a table, um, just like you might scratch your skin. And so you need that electronic device to heal if it's going to be really expensive and have all the functionality that you want. And so we've basically been looking at how do we get these different layers, which you need for the electronic functionality. Um, you need like a conductive layer, an insulating layer, right. so you can build your electronic devices. How do you get them all to register each other and then heal? Um, in a kind of single device without manual realign. That sets me up perfectly for my my next question was going to be asking you about the multi uh, multiple layer approach. Um, what are the benefits of using different materials versus I think the the concept of it being stronger being the same material is kind of well known. Um, yeah, definitely. So, so what's the benefits there? Of yeah, I, I think it's easier. If, so if you start just with the benefit of self healing that that has been around for a while, and the the main kind of way that people have done this is they take a, sh a electronic structure that has different like conductive layers, for example, and they create those conductive layers by doping the polymer with some type of composite. So you add some like conductive nanotubes or nanowires, and then you put your insulating polymer on top and then you, you build up these layers and then it's self healing because if you cut those in half and you bring them back together, uh, the polymer can diffuse across that interface and heal. Um, the, the issue is that you have to make those layers thick enough so that when you bring them together, you can manually realign them. So you, you can imagine like if you have a cut and you have two pieces, you need to perfectly bring them back together if you want to ins uh, restore the electrical function of the device. The mechanical function, so you know, once you stick those two pieces together, you can stretch them again, but they won't work as a device unless those layers heal. And so the, the trade-off is normally if you use different polymers for your different layers, uh, then the, the issue becomes now those layers don't adhere well to each other. And so when you stretch them, the device just splits at those layers. Uh, and so it's no longer one uniform device. Uh, and so then what we've been working on basically is how do you keep the interface adhesion strong so that the device is functional? Um, but then now you actually have the ability to get the realignment between these layers without doing any type of manual adjustment on your own. Awesome. So one of the things that you get to in your paper is that you used kind of different devices. Is there a difference in the polymers at all with different implementation? Yeah, yeah this is a great question. So so our paper right now is really a proof of concept just to show that this can be done. So we only right. use two polymers in this case. Um, but like what we're working on now is extending it to other polymer systems. Um, in, in all the devices, the polymer is kind of the matrix and we get different functionality in the layers by adding different particles. So we can either add conductive particles if we want it to be electrically conductive. We add magnetic particles in the paper to basically have some magnetic assembly capabilities in the device. Um, so in all those scenarios, we can use 
we are, we're either using one of the two different polymers right. that we're showcasing in the paper. Um, but by doping them with different composites, we get this different functionality. Um, I think I should straight out ask you, what were the polymers involved in this particular study? Yeah, so we use polydimethyl siloxane, which is PDMS. Um, so it's like a lot of silicones uh, basically are produced by industry. So it's at scale, which is nice. And then also polypropylene glycol, which is also a very common one used in a lot of like polyurethanes, mm. um, which like if you have like memory foam mattress or pillows, those types of polymers. Um, so yeah, and, and then basically we just have hydrogen bonding interactions, which are these dynamic reversible interactions that can associate and dissociate along the backbone. So in both cases, we kind of have one long chain of either PDMS or PPG, which is the polypropylene glycol. And then along that backbone, we have these different bonds that can associate together. And at the interface between the PDMS and the PPG, they have the same bonds. So those bonds mm. can form at the interface to help kind of weld them together. Uh, so when you started working on this paper, did you know where you were headed? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I think to some extent we had an idea. We, we knew that we wanted to get the layers to realign. Um, we didn't know exactly what would be needed in order to do that. Um, because we, we had an idea like, oh, we, we need them to basically not be missable with each other. So if you think about oil and water and like a salad dressing, you shake them up and the oil and the water will separate over time. So we need the polymers to do the same thing. Um, so we kind of knew that, but then we need them to not separate too much at that interface where they become too weak. Um, so that was basically just tuning how many of these dynamic bonds do we need? And then how fast can we get that realignment to happen? Um, one of the cool things that I don't think we anticipated is that the paper has a large amount of theory kind of in the back end. So right. there's a, a nice practical application where we kind of show things are working. And then at the end, we have some devices. But in, in the middle, I guess, there's a really good fundamental understanding basically of it, exactly why these are miscible and even what the interface between those profiles will look like at a very small like nanometer scale. So can we talk a little bit about um, the facility itself? Because part of where our funding came in was part of the shared uh, nano facilities that you have at Stanford. Can you tell me a little bit about what tools you have there and what bit of the work could only happen in that kind of facility? Yeah, definitely. So uh, a lot of the work was done in Stanford Nano Shared Facilities. There's a sub branch called the Soft Materials Facility. So a lot of the characterization of the polymers is done in that soft materials characterization. So like really nice rheometers, uh, DMA. Um, we do some contact angle measurements and things like that. Um, and those those we can do. We we actually spend a lot of time using that SMF rheometer um, to basically design a new method where we're we're taking the two polymers and pressing them together and then separating them. Uh, so, so one of the classic ways they measure self-healing is you take it, you cut the polymer, you bring the two pieces together, and then you pull them apart. And it takes some energy and some force to pull them apart. And you can compare that to how much it would take just to pull the regular polymer apart. So this works really well when you're using the same type of polymer for both slabs. But if you use two different types of polymers, it's hard to keep the contact area constant between those two mm -hmm. and keep them uh, like during the healing process, basically, in good contact. And so what we've been doing on the SMF rheometer is basically designing a kind of machine controlled method where it can bring them into contact for a certain amount of time and then separate them. And then we get the data and then we can repeat this process over and over again under different healing conditions. Um, so and that's almost something... acts like a Band-Aid or something like, yes, like we yeah. would with any normal injury for a person. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so this gives us a good kind of mechanical understanding of what's happening between those polymers. And then we couple that, we used a lot of the like um, imaging. So we use an atomic force micro microscope um, that's part of the, the shared facilities at Stanford, um, as well as some like x-ray photo electron spectroscopy to kind of look at those interfacial behavior features where basically we have these two polymers and we want to know, uh, we know they don't mix totally like low water. We want to know how right. much they mix in a small scale. So those types of, you know, when you only have 10 nanometers to work with, uh, having access to this really nice equipment is good because you need that resolution in order to see what's going on. And that provides the fundamental understanding, which helps us match the theory, which then helps us say, okay, well, at a device level, how do we like rapidly change the molecular design of the polymer so that we have the properties we need for the devices that we want to make? Awesome. So what was the biggest challenge in the process for you? Ooh, I, I, measurement was actually a pretty big challenge. I mean, uh, just because this is a different, like most systems are looking at self-healing where you have the same polymer. Right. So we, we took a lot of those techniques and we, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do we adapt this to a system where we have two different polymers where 
it's not as easy potentially to do the same type of self-healing experience. You know, one easy self-healing experiment is just you take your polymer and you just cut it and then you just wash the cut heel over time. Um, but then there, of course, there's no good analog for that when you have two different polymers because, you know, you need the cut to be precisely at the interface. Mm -hmm. And then one of the main issues is if you cut two times, I, I, this was a fascinating part of the project for us. You know, you think you take a really sharp knife and you cut the polymer slab into two pieces. So you have two different types of polymers. So you cut each slab and then you take one piece from each and bring them together. Well, it turns out, even though they look like really nice cuts to you, at the like micro or even nano scale, they're just super rough. And so those cuts don't match at all. And you have lots of air gaps. And those air gaps can basically create a lot of variability. In your sample. So mm -hmm. uh, definitely, I think the rough premise worked well. Like we had a good idea initially, even that it was, it was going to work. Um, th the easy way that we knew it would work is if you take these polymers and melt them, they still behave like oil and water. So the way we make all these devices is you just take a chunk of polymer, you heat it up and press it into a nice film. And then you take the next chunk of polymer, you heat it up and press it into a film on top of that polymer. So we're confident they're not going to mix. And then we're, we kind of can do some easy checks to see if they realign. Um, but really trying to understand exactly what's going on at the fundamental level. We spent a lot of time getting rid of these measurements. So I think part of the the layering you've talked about is is having different, I guess in the in the commercial product that would be in the future that they'd have different kind of abilities or capabilities. And I'm wondering how many layer, like how thick did you get to be working with? Oh, in the actually, the it's yeah. This is a good question. It's uh, easier the thicker it is. Really? Um, it, mainly because you know, in a classic self healing device, you make the layers thick so you can do manual realignment. Um, and so for us, actually, the main driving force is for a lot of these electronic devices, we want to go to really thin layers. Right. Because we can like basically have higher density of devices, we can have better performance. Um, and so so we got down to like three or four microns for each layer in like a up to 10 layer device. Um, but yeah, you, you can go thick as well. Um, and you can, you know, now we're thinking, yeah, we did this with two polymers. We have a pretty good understanding of what the fundamentals are that are driving the space separation between these two and this realignment phenomenon. So a little more theory to figure out, you know, how fast can we really get it to realign? Why is it that fast? Mm -hmm. How do we probe that from a measurement standpoint and from a theory standpoint? But then, you know, if we have five or six different polymers, what kind of layers can we make? Um, if we have polymers that have even different properties kind of compared to the ones we've used are kind of very classic standard polymers. So you can also imagine expanding beyond right to make these more complex multi-layer structures and things like that but i think i think using the more standard polymers is going to be important for your scaling portion yes yes that's very true that's very true um what was the most exciting moment for you uh so so the way we we make these after we've stacked them all up and then we we cut the polymers we bring them together so we we know they're misaligned then we took them, we put them in the oven, we take them out of the oven and we look at them again and then they're realigned. That was definitely the best part. Because until like, that moment, you you feel like everything should work. You have a good, right. hopeful guess and you have a hypothesis, but it's not until you actually see them realign. And in the in the paper you can see, we we put the device on a crosslink substrate, so something that won't heal. And so that marks the cut location. So you can see the crosslink substrate is still offset and then you can see the layers above it are perfectly aligned. So that was, yeah, that was definitely the Right. It worked. You get yeah, that, exactly. That, like, <laughs> um, so one of the, the other things that's interesting is you have a provisional patent. Have you personally been involved in, do you have any other patents? Is this your first time with that process? What was that like for you? Yeah, it was a good process. We, we have a couple um, from- I know there's a bunch these, in the lab group, but- Yeah, from the, from the dynamic polymer work, at least, uh, I- I've had the opportunity to work on a couple projects. So one of them is involving like shape memory polymers that can actuate. So we have a, mm -hmm. a provisional on that as well as one on some underwater adhesives. Um, uh, similar, some similar chemical structures, but obviously tuned for different applications. Right. Um, it's, it's really nice. I think uh, one of the benefits of like having the patent office at Stanford is they really take care of most of the stuff. So you can, right. <laughs> you have the core amount of science done and then they do a great job of breaking it down into the technical jargon that you need to follow. Um, right, so that makes it a little easier. Been, I think way smoother than if I had to do it on my own for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think the one thing I sort of skipped is, is the different, I feel like we didn't get into the different device types that you 
tested and you have some photos of kind of the different structures. Can you guide us through that a little bit? Yeah. So I mentioned earlier that one of the kind of advantages of this system is that we can realign at smaller link scales. Um, so one of the first devices we showed was just a pressure sensor that's a capacitor. And then one of the advantages, there, there's two advantages. One is very easy and then one is a little more subtle. So the first advantage is that the middle layer we can now make thin. Uh, and so the way the pressure sensor works is basically you have two electrically conductive layers and then you have an insulating layer in the middle. And when you press those conducting layers closer together, you can register the pressure basically by the change in the capacitance between those two electrical plates. Um, so for us, it was really nice because we can now make this pressure sensor where you can cut it in half and it can heal. But we can have this middle layer be very, very thin, where before you were limited by the fact that because you had to do this manual alignment, you would have to go to maybe like 100 microns or a millimeter or so. Right. The second advantage uh, is something that we, we haven't characterized fully. We talk a little bit about it in the paper just as kind of an offshoot. Because the layers are immiscible, the pressure sensor is actually more stable when you're cycling it for a really long time. So you can imagine you have normally, you have used three different layers and you have a conductive layer that's a composite and you have another conductive layer that's a composite and then you have an insulating layer in the middle. If all three layers have the same polymer, the composite can flow into the middle layer. Um, those like nanotubes or silver nanowires. And especially when you're applying pressure over and over again, uh, you can kind of push those layers together. Um, and so that's another issue that happens when you start to go really thin, the device will start to fail because the, basically these composites will start to puncture. Um, but in our case, actually, it looks like now when we have this immiscible layer in between, we have much more stable performance when we're cycling this sensor for a long period of time. I wanted to talk to you about kind of feature uh, implementation and what what kind of devices would you imagine this being useful for in the future? Yeah, so one uh, other thing that we just really shortly demonstrate in the paper is if you if you take a magnetic shell, or you take magnetic particles and put them in the polymer, you can create these core shell fibers, for example, or you can create pieces of material uh, that are magnetically aligned in some direction. And if you apply them to a magnetic field, you can get them to move around and assemble. So we have a video of this where these different pieces right. look like they're kind of dancing around and then all of a sudden they snap together into a rod. Um, and also a video where we kind of have a circuit that's underwater where the inner core is an electrical wire and the outer core is a magnetic shell. And so as you bring these pieces together, the magnetic shell helps align the pieces so that the electrical wire in the middle is aligned. And then once everything is connected, an LED lights up. Uh, and so I think in the future, you can imagine we, we have the ability now, we bring the pieces together. When we heal them, they'll realign to their correct state. Uh, and so now you can think about like if we have all these different pieces that are scattered, we uh, could potentially, if we wanted to go inside the human body, for example, uh, ingest them in separate pieces and then have them assemble in the body in some location. Um, or we can have them assemble for a period of time and then disassemble. I think uh, the idea is like we start to think about how can we get these to reconfigure to be, you have the same functional components. You have these different building blocks, basically. What kind of devices can you build out of those building blocks and can you do this in a reversible manner? Where can it go? And specifically where can it go is what we're interested in. It's like either can we make these really thin layers that we can coat kind of onto the skin that can do these what your Apple Watch can do, but like looks like a little tattoo that you put on your skin. Right. Um, or can we do things by like taking small pieces and putting them in the body where they can easily move around to the right area? And then maybe the more complex part, they can assemble on the surface of an organ or things like that to then have a more complex sensing ability that maybe it stays there longer term and potentially is not invasive. But those are, you know, long term visions. So, right. Very cool technology, though. Um, so, th the last question is what's next for you? What's the next step? Oh yeah, so for me personally, I'm uh, going to NIST. I'll be working on an upcycling project, uh, basically taking kind of commercial plastics, uh, like milk jugs um, and grocery bags and trying to convert them into kind of more valuable products using some of these dynamic bonds that I've been studying in my graduate school. Um, and then after that, I'll be starting at Washington University in St. Louis as an assistant professor in their EEC department. Awesome. Well, congratulations, and, and thanks for joining us for the podcast today. Yeah, thank you very much. Special thanks to Christopher B. Cooper. For The Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.